Okay, so my video controlled clock says it's five minutes past 4 p.m. here in Vienna this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining me here for the last sessions of this year uh, Open Source Summit uh, Europe here in Vienna. My name is Werner. I'm working at Thomas Crane for meanwhile 19 years and 18 days. So <laughs> next year I have my 20 year uh, anniversary and uh, this it shows that uh, it's a nice place to be in the open source space and there are lots of companies out there who uh, yeah, still keep on going in this area and funding people in this area although the main business is something very different or something different. So uh, for my role at Thomas Krenn, it's a, a server vendor in Germany in the Bavarian forest. So somehow like uh, Asterix and Obelix did back a few hundred years ago, we're still trying to keep a little bit out of the cloud, uh, having customers running uh, IT also in dedicated system. And yeah, this still works. And fortunately, a lot of people do this with Linux and yeah, that's the reason why I'm able to, to work in the, in the Linux area. So um, I've already seen uh, yeah, some well-known faces. I'm not sure whether or not you have read the, the track description here. It's the 101 open source uh, yeah, essential tracks, some kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Let's check a few questions just before we start here so that I can get an idea about uh, the knowledge in here. And I think the knowledge is, yeah, seems to be very high. So uh, just raise your hand. Who of you has ever ran a tune to FS minus L? Okay, now I'm a little bit happy. It's about 30%. So from the faces, I thought it would be 90%. And then I thought, okay, what should I tell the rest of the <laughs> 40 minutes here? Uh, so who has ever configured a software rate, MD rate? Okay, that's interesting. That's even more. Okay, about 40%. Nice. Um, who of you has ever cared about the I.O. scheduler? Okay. And who of you that are younger than 25 has ever cared uh, about the I.O. scheduler? <laughs> okay, one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's the reason why none is a very often used <laughs> type of scheduling these days. <laughs> um, and yeah, on the other side, who of you has ever used the NVMe CLI? on the command line? Okay, about 10%. And maybe the most important question is it's already 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, did everybody of you have enough coffee this day so that you can stay awake uh, for the rest of the, uh, of the show here for the last uh, half an hour? Okay, so uh, let's get started um, about the agenda. What will we go through today? Um, on the right side, you see uh, uh, the picture how the storage works or seems to work in the Linux area. And on the left, the agenda. First of all, why do we need secondary storage at all? So why do we need permanent storage these days? Um, although it's often well known, it's good to get back and, and, and step one step back to, to get the reasons why this makes sense. What is the user's view of uh, the data? And then go through the different uh, layers in the stacks from the virtual file system, a few examples of block-based file systems like xd3, xd4, and butterfs. And then it gets really interesting when it goes down to the bio layer, uh, how we can uh, control things there, how we can optimize things there with the remapper stuff, doing things, putting on top of each other and then go through the block layer, uh, the multi-queue uh, uh, things, the IO schedulers down to the device drivers. And finally, this brings up this big picture of how these things work all together. And I still know my first conference of the Linux Foundation. It was uh, back in 2011 in Prague. It has been called uh, LinuxCon back then, um, not Open Source Summit yet. And I was there and uh, wanted to know how these things work. And I can still remember, I was very happy that I've seen uh, Hannes Reinecke from SUS and uh, I, I knew him just from the mailing list and uh, was aware that he is a maintainer of the Linux kernel. And uh, yeah, so I 
asked him if he can explain to me how these things are working. In the first moment, I wasn't sure whether or not I'm allowed to ask him, but I, then I knew the, uh, uh, yeah, the Linux environment and that everybody can talk to everybody, and that's really, really nice. And yeah, we started to discuss, and then Christoph Helwe came along and uh, thought, okay, now there are two of them, and they can tell me everything about how it works, and now we'll get the final picture. And, it was very funny back then because um, they, they started to, to draw lines and how things work together. And after a few minutes, they started real arguing about each other, how it can be seen and how it should work. And that uh, gave me the thing, okay, how should I understand how it works when you, <laughs> uh, the two of you are not the same opinion there. But yeah, after a few years and uh, big work or big help from them, um, finally, I, I got an idea how these things are working together. And once you are going through these things, it isn't as complicated as it seems to be. But yeah, to start off, uh, why do we need secondary storage at all? And how has it been five years ago, 10 years ago, or even 100 years ago? And how permanent is the data that we store now compared to the data that has been stored a few hundred years ago? And just to take a few examples on the upper left, uh, I'm still working in an analog way here regarding the calendar dates. Um, typical data which you have on a smartphone, for example, or your knowledge, writing books, uh, having plans, documentation, construction plans, and even encyclopedias, which we had in the, in the past uh, um, when I was a young boy, really in the bookshelf, and which have now everything online, data stored online. And yeah, for sure, in addition to those kinds of data, pictures, media data, videos, growing each day with every picture you take, uh, and all this data needs to be stored permanent, and it should be available in 10 years or 20 years still. So when you're taking pictures, you want them, your children, to be able to view them, and to view them as sure as you can view the pictures of your grandparents right now. And also to get an idea how long this data should be available, um, when you see uh, the Saturday in my calendar in the next event here, uh, it's a 100-year anniversary of the local power plant in my hometown. So it's the case that things are they are for a longer time than it might you might think that they will be, and that's also true for data. And that's a good reason why it makes sense to think about how we can restore data for a long time. Uh, in an efficient and uh, in, a, in a reliable way, too. So when it gets to the view of the user, what does the, the user want from us as a, a, a Linux community um, to uh, store the data? It's very easy on the one side. Uh, the user wants to store data, wants to write it to a device or somewhere in the cloud, doesn't matter what the device uh, is, and gets the data back. And also at some point in the future, and the user doesn't care how it works in between. Um, when it gets to the technical stuff, uh, I'm sure most of you are knowing that writing data is done in a, in a way that it's write, written to a block device. So, for example, if you take this hard drive uh, here, uh, what is a block device? We have a row of blocks, and each block has the same size, and we need comments to read and to write. But it's really some kind of far away compared to having just this picture getting stored. So there must be a way to go all through these layers. And as I, I'm only a user too, I'm not a kernel developer myself, I just want to understand how things work and, and uh, uh, to get an idea how we can use this for, for us and our customers in a, in a constructive way. Um, I will go through a, a, a simple approach here. So there are different kinds of how you can access the data here. It can be in a synchronous or in an asynchronous way. And for these um, possibilities, um, you can go to the kernel, um, the kernel IOs in a synchronous and asynchronous way, and here we will really concentrate in the simple synchronous IO done by the kernel. So I'll not uh, I'll go through the, the uh, async stuff or even uh, SPDK when it can 
access the storage uh, from user space for that I'll refer to uh, a presentation uh, back from the uh, STC in 2019 just to keep uh, things um, easy going here for the for the rest of the presentation so to make uh, this complicated diagram a little bit easier right now I've simplified it in, in multiple ways and as mentioned uh, I've tried to use the whole space here, so excuse me if you can view everything here. Um, up there we have the applications we are using, and with those applications we want to access uh, our file system. And here, uh, the Unix and uh, also Linux has a, a very good a clue, a very good idea, that they've virtualized this layer, so it doesn't depend which kind of file system you're using uh, uh, here, so there are different kinds of them. Uh, I will show some details on that uh, in a few slides. Going from block uh, devices, which is this stuff we've seen on the slides before, and which is most often used, via network-based file system, and also and that's a very nice thing from Linux, from the Linux or Unix side, uh, for pseudo uh, file system and special file systems. So you can access a lot of different devices, just like a file in Linux. And that makes it very easy for many things. You can uh, control things or tune things in the same way when it is a device than it is a file. And this is really lots of advantages here. And when you want to store real data, um, you're getting down the line uh, and converting the stuff from uh, yeah, file system data to block IOs, which can be written to block devices further on. And here the, the interesting stuff of the block layer begins. Uh, when you have those BIOS going down, you see here that there's the possibility to uh, go around. So you don't need to go down to the hardware in the first place. You have the chance to um, use different kind of stackable devices here. And that's really nice because you can add a lot of functionality without having the need to have any specialized hardware for that. And yeah, this makes it easy to, to use a lot of, of things uh, which had the need of specialized hardware before. And over the time, more and more functionality went in here. And I will show some examples here, here too. Okay. And in case you do not need that functionality or have gone through this functionality, you have set up your software rate and stuff like that, it goes down further down the hardware. But before you reach the hardware, uh, there's the block layer, um, which has been for a long time a single queue mechanism um, that was sufficient enough for hard drives, but not efficient enough uh, for flash devices anymore. And for that reason, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, Jens Axby, Christoph Helwig, and some others uh, started to design a multi-queue um, layout, um, which is working with software and hardware queues, which will also give some more details uh, further on. And when it's gone through all this stuff, you have then requests, which can be one or more, or can contain one or more BIOS. And those requests are then really um, for a, a, a special hardware. So it depends then on the, on the hardware, on the driver, and on the devices, how these requests are built. And then they are, are written, written down. And you see here a very important uh, uh, track on, on the right side, a, a way where you can write BIOS directly to the driver and, and to the device without going through the block MQ layer stuff using requests, but using BIOS instead. This has been a way which has been used for flash devices uh, before the uh, block MQ stuff was born. And uh, it's still used for two or three uh, devices and one of them being the N64 cartridge driver, which is still using this interface, which is enough here. Um, so you see Linux is used everywhere and when there's a need for a hardware device driver and one Linux developer wants to have it and uh, yeah, he works 
long enough on that, he can get it into the kernel. And it doesn't need to be 20 years, like for the real-time stuff, some things, when it's an easier task, can get faster here, here too. But I have to admit, I've never used a driver yet, so unfortunately, I don't have an N64. <laughs> OK. So then let's uh, get into more details on the, on the first layer on the virtual file system. Um, the virtual file system itself has been introduced before Linux was invented in the, in the Linux and uh, in the Unix area. And back then in the old days when I was not born, I was a baby, there was not a generic way how to access file systems. So um, before that, in the 70s, for example, one had to write uh, an application and when he wanted to use a file system, he had to use a read, a write, every time uh, developed individually, depending on what file system has been used on the, underneath. And that doesn't scale. And for that reason, in the mid 80s, uh, the virtual file system has been introduced. And this provides a generic interface for the applications, for the important operations like the, the read, the write, the two uh, main operations, and also uh, uh, other syscalls like open, uh, stat, or statx to get uh, uh, metadata, uh, change mode. And this functionality works always in the same way, regardless which file system is used. And that's not only true for block file systems, that's also for, for network-based file systems and for the, for the special uh, purpose file systems uh, then, then too. And yeah, when it, we put this into a, a picture, uh, in the Linux uh, kernel, we have four uh, main uh, types of file system. We have the block file systems, like ext4, uh, butterfs, uh, xfs, and so on. Network-based file systems, like nfs, pseudo file system, like the proc file system. Uh, special file systems like the tempfs, uh, warmfs file systems, and also some other stuff like uh, stackable file systems where you can do like the things we have mentioned before for the device mapper. You can do this in the file system too. File system in user space where still a lot of development and optimizations are going on. There have been recently optimizations included in the kernel for that. And also raw flash, which are using then uh, uh, a different way, not going via block IOs, but uh, then it get in uh, on, on the lower layers again. And normally, when you go through the file system, you're using also the page cache. Um, you can also configure direct IO when you don't want to have memory involved for some reasons, but most of the time you're going via the page cache. And uh, then it goes to the, to the other layers uh, down. And one interesting thing here is that it's not only the local system, there's also the possibility to come from other systems here. Uh, we are having here two I.O. targets, uh, the Linux I.O. target, uh, which can be used, for example, for, for iSCSI when you want to act as an iSCSI server. Or on the other side, the NVMe target uh, for um, uh, the possibility to, to be shared as an NVMe device, where you get then the block IOs from, from those drivers and put them down to the, to the next layers then. And for all this to work in the virtual file system, when we go uh, back to the central point of the slide here, uh, there are a different kind of data structures to hold all this information together. And I just want to mention the four types, these are, or the four main types, like inode, directory, entries, file, objects, and superblocks. And here the, uh, the data structure is configured uh, in this VFS layer too. And I won't go, go through uh, all the four of them, uh, but to get an idea how these things are working, I want to show some information about uh, the index node, the I nodes, which are, and this configuration here, or this uh, 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 specification here, is generic for the for the virtual file system. So 
um, uh, concrete file system doesn't have to implement all those uh, things, uh, but most of them, of, of them do. And for the inodes, for example, they contain only the, uh, the metadata of the file describing the actual data, containing no real uh, user data, uh, but nevertheless holding a lot of uh, uh, important um, information here. So this can be um, from the mode bits, so the rights for the, the owner of a file, for the group of the file, or the other users, or the information uh, for a file to which user the file belongs, to which group does the file belong, or um, even other things, how many hard links are pointing to this file, and what are the last time the file has been opened, modified, or the last time that the inode was changed, um, so the metadata has been changed. I mentioned this here because most people think of the, the, the C time, the creation time, but it's not the creation time, it's the time when the inode has been changed. So other things like file size beginning to end, number of used blocks, and, and so on. And yeah, as it's often asked for, for Linux newbies, uh, also when you are working with a file system, I show this here with a with a start command, which I use is using, in fact, the start x um, system call. So I'm writing to a file here uh, on the top, and I'm executing uh, the start command, which is using start x in the background. You notice here that I don't get uh, three, but I get four uh, date information or timing information in here. And the reason here is that uh, with the start uh, x um, syscall, uh, the, the date for the creation time, for the birth time of the, of the file itself has been added here too. So we have the C time, and here it's called not creation time, but birth time, and it's in the underlying ext4 file system stored. So I have this information here. Uh, when I read the file, uh, the access time gets updated here, uh, the others uh, uh, aren't updated here, so only um, this one gets updated. Um, on the same time, when I write an additional line to this file, so I change the data, not only the inode, but I'm changing the data, um, the modification time and the C time, the change time are updated here. Uh, why is the C time updated? As I'm writing to the uh, file itself and the file is growing, the number of uh, blocks are used may arise, for example, and also the, the modification time gets updated. Also, the C time gets updated uh, here. And when I only change metadata of the file, so I'll keep the, the contents of the file this, uh, the same, I don't change anything here, but I change, for example, the mode bits. So I say, okay, members of the group may also write to the file, um, only the, the C time gets updated uh, here because the inode was changed. Why was the inode changed? Uh, the mode bits have been changed and they are part of the inode here. And so uh, the C time is being changed. And so you see, uh, although for newbies these comments might uh, uh, be a little bit confusing in the first way, when you just take a look at the, the kernel source and go through the, the things and want to understand that it's not that uh, hard as one, one may, may think. And that's true for, for every layer and for every area of the kernel. The, the problem is that the there are so many areas, so you have to decide where you want to, to, to look to look at. But uh, once you've solved that, it's not that hard to find to find out. So to go one step further, let's uh, take a block file system as an example, a file system which is around for a very long time and a file system which has been developed uh, especially for Linux. Um, for those file systems, which you could also call uh, your um, file systems that have been developed for Linux, all the functionality is implemented here. Um, 
and for other things like the FAT file system or other ones which are originally designed for other operating systems, there may be some information be lacking. So it really depends on the file systems uh, what kind of information you have in the inode. Um, yeah, for the example for ext3, it's a so-called block-based file system. They have additional information in the inode where it has references to the different areas where the actual data is stored. And this worked out for quite a long time. But as you can see, it can get very complicated and it limits the amount of data which can be stored in one single file. So over the years, uh, it turned out that there must be another solution too to be able to store lots of data without having the need to having yeah, those uh, big reference tables in there. And for that, the, the extent um, idea has been born, which has been introduced into X3 with a patch. And this was uh, also one of the main features then of EXT4. Um, compared to blocks, which have a, a really fixed uh, size for the file system, the extents have a variable size. Uh, they do not address individual blocks, but have a map of uh, areas of the file. So, uh, there are three levels for the, this acquired the start um, uh, of the extent, uh, the size of the error in the file, and the number of the first data block on the disk. And with, with this information, uh, it's easier to um, organize big files here. And that's also the reason why uh, ext4 was soon a successor of the ext3. And in addition to other important features, like having a shown also being able uh, to recover the data in case of a power outage. It also has features for pre-allocation and delayed allocation. So it's uh, for most use cases, the standard file system being used uh, on Linux system um, here. Uh, and for having other important features known mainly uh, by storage systems and other things like uh, ZFS, BARFS has been born a long time ago and is also broad used by now. Um, yeah, for timing reasons, I won't only get uh, with one slide to BARFS. It's a so-called copy on write file system. So you don't have to maintain a journal here. When you're writing uh, new data, you're writing it to a new position and updating the metadata uh, afterwards. Uh, so this makes it easier in case of a power outage. You have other features like compression, sub uh, volumes, integrated weight, and resize functionality within the file system. So you can see here that it's possible to implement different features on different levels um, in the stack. So these are things which can also be implemented uh, down below uh, in the device mapper, but it can also be used in the file system. It, it really depends on your individual needs what's the best solution for you, what fits your needs in the best, in the best way. Okay, to sum up this first um, area here, um, we went through the applications over there, um, which are using different kinds of so-called syscalls, uh, accessing the file system, and you're seeing there are really lots of file system in the virtual uh, file system layer, they're not even all of them uh, in the diagram here shown. So the most important one like uh, ext, badfs, xfs. Uh, there are also other things like uh, yeah, for, for uh, DVD images back then, the ISO images uh, or special use cases, rfs, squashfs. When you want to have encryption, you can use uh, ecryptfs here network-based, and you see when the network-based are used, you're going another way down there. You don't issue block IOs on the local system, but instead going uh, via the network to another system out there, or even going to the user space with a file system in user space. And yeah, on the right side, in the orange box is the pseudo special purpose and raw flash file systems, which are using another way. And on the very left and on the very right, where you see the different I.O. targets, the normal Linux I.O. target on the left and the NVMe target on the right, you see there are even multiple ways 
uh, to go into these targets and they can come from the network or they can come from below with come some kind of loop devices here. So uh, there are really, really many, many ways to go through this and um, yeah, it really shows that Linux can be used yeah, nearly everywhere because uh, you have everywhere some uh, points where you can enter the, the queue or, or leave the queue and that's one of the reasons why it's used in a, in a broad way. It's very, really very, very, very flexible on, on this, uh, in this area. Okay. So we have 20 minutes left. And I have to be in time because I want to reach one of the few trains which are going to the west today. <laughs> <laughs> and this also shows the importance of having multiple ways when we go further below um, in the device map, but are not only the, the uh, bio-based device mapper targets, there are also the request-based device mapper targets. And one of them is the device mapper multipath target. And this is very important uh, when you're going to with the train to the west, there have been four paths in the past and all of them have been interrupted uh, the last days and with today's morning there's one of the four paths opened again. And as I think it's a FIFO queue when you want to get through it, I want to <laughs> reach one of, uh, one of them. I, I hope maybe some tagging helps. I tried to reserve a few seats, uh, but one of the Trains have been cancelled, so um, yeah, we'll see. But this shows the importance in the real life. <laughs> okay, but we are not on the multipath yet. We are still higher up uh, in the stacked block device in the remapper area, like different uh, bio-based device mapper targets, uh, like the multiple device MD software rate stuff, or things like uh, the distributed replicated block device DRBD. Uh, yeah, those are the things which are here for the device mapper. It's often used by uh, logical volume management. Uh, you have more than 20 different targets for different kind of functionality. The last ones being the uh, virtual device optimizer, which was, I think, included in kernel 6.7, 8 or 9 or something like that. Um, and other things which are often used, like the, the dmcrypt targets when you set up a Linux machine, uh, like the one I'm using here, um, most of the time the installer automatically uh, sets up a LVM and enables you to lose, use uh, encryption. So in case uh, your laptop gets stolen, um, there's no problem because everything is encrypted on there. And in addition to those production use cases, there are also targets for debugging purposes to introduce uh, some delays, for example, and stuff like that, that makes it easier for developers to optimize their uh, recovery functionality for file systems, for example. And going back to the diagram, how does this show here? We came down from the virtual file system using a block file system, for example, uh, which generates our block IOs going further down and here we want to use additional functionality. And the really nice thing here is that we can put things on top of each other and we are not limited here. So for example, uh, if you are a student and you want to build a high available system, uh, you can afford two hard drives but you cannot afford a hardware rate controller as me and a colleague of mine have been 20 years ago. Um, you can use uh, here the uh, MD functionality, uh, sorry, the, no, the MD functionality to configure a software rate, so having two devices. So it means you going down, configure your MD device here, and this device consists of two hard drives which are going then further down there. So here you have your first layer uh, of redundancy and you are going around here. Okay, then we said uh, we are two people, uh, each, of one, each of us uh, has a server. Um, we have enough space from a harder perspective, so let's uh, copy the data from one to each other. So in case one server has an issue, we have the data also on the other server here. So we've used DRPD. 
uh, back then when we've been at university. And this was a good idea because then uh, Thomas Krenn and Max Wittenzell, the founder of the company, needed the functionality. And so we had the possibility to do this there. And we're still here after 20 years now. Uh, so using open source is often a good idea. <laughs> Um, so we went another round through here. So we've set up DRPD on top of our software right here. And then we wanted to use virtual machines on top of that. And we didn't know how much space we need in each virtual machine. So what did we want to do? We wanted to have some flexibility here. So we've set up LVM on top of it. So in fact, we have going, we are going three times around here having uh, a software rate on top of two hard drives, then the DAPD stuff for copying, and then on top of it, a logical volume manager uh, with this volume group, and then the logical volume. So, and maybe you want to encrypt it, but uh, <laughs> so you can go here through multiple times. And the good thing is uh, you, you, you do not really lose any performance here. So it's really fast. It's really working fast for years. And you're really very flexible. After some time when we earned money, we were able to buy SSDs. So each of one, us has now one hard drive, one SSD. So we changed something in here. And the stack and the kernel does all by itself in a magic way further on. So you can really use a lot of nice features uh, for that purpose. And yeah, when you're going down and want to optimize things, an important thing to know is that as long as you are on this layer here, you don't have any multi queues. You don't have any I.O. scheduling at all for the stacked block devices. These are things that happen uh, one uh, uh, floor below. So to show this, uh, this is an output of my uh, yeah, uh, X39 thinkpad here. Um, as mentioned, I'm using LVM with an encrypted device. So I'm having here uh, my uh, deencrypt target um, being def uh, device mapper zero here. And as you see, there is no MQ subdirectory in the, in the sysfs here. There are no IO schedulers to, uh, to choose from. So on this layer, you don't have this stuff. This follows uh, one layer below in the IO scheduler. And I think you have to hurry up a little bit. Uh, when it comes down to the multi-queue architecture. And this is a thing which has been introduced about 10 years ago and which really allows to get the performance that you need uh, from flash devices. Back then with hard drives, um, hard drives have only one single queue uh, where you can go through and with a parallel organized flash devices, um, it turned out that it was a really uh, bottleneck here. And from that, uh, to optimize the design was in the following way that you're having hardware queues and per core software queues. So you don't have to do any locking anymore. You don't have to synchronize any caches uh, between different uh, NUMA, core, uh, NUMA nodes in, in, in your CPU setup. And the optimum way is you have the same number of hardware queues than the same number of CPUs that you have. And these are working the following way. Um, you're having those software queues. Uh, for each CPU, you have one queue. And here can uh, uh, merge requests. You can reorder requests. And also doing uh, the I.O. Uh, scheduling um, with different schedulers, like uh, the MQ deadline, BFQ, or Kyber ones, or none, which is technically not a, not a scheduler. Um, and which is mainly mess necessary for hard drives. So for, for NVMEs, you don't need this. Most of the time you can have advantages of it, but it really depends. And the important thing is when you're having a scheduling, you want to reorder the requests. This only happens in the software queues and not in the hardware queues. And for the hardware queues, it depends on the hardware, how many queues you implement. Uh, it will not be more than the number of cores. And the thing is that those queues are independent from each other. So you don't need to do any locking. You don't need to do um, any remapping of, of caches or resynchronizing of caches. And this is where you gain all the performance from. 
And for an example, that's not my, my laptop here, that's my home PC uh, with a six core CPU, having uh, M.2 uh, solid IMP41 uh, M.2 SSD, which has 16 hardware queues. So the SSD would be capable of having 16 queues here, but because my CPU has only six cores without having hyperthreading in the CPU, uh, the kernel generates only six queues here. If I would change the CPU to an eight core CPU with hyperthreading, I would get 16 queues here. So this is uh, fixed in the, in the kernel how, how, this, how this worked and optimizes it uh, here for this, for this setup. And you can also see this in the, um, in the terminal. We're having six cores. We are seeing, okay, um, six queues, each having uh, one CPU in there, although the SSD has 16 queues from a hardware perspective. For the SATA drive, which I have also in my, in my PC, there's one single queue, and here it's the way that uh, I have only one queue, but here six CPUs are in the queue, and here the scheduler is used, as I'm using here in hard drive. And yet you have further ideas, what's in the data center. Data center SSDs typically don't have eight or 16 queues. You see here, for example, a Kioxia CD8 uh, NVMe SSD, and here you have, for example, 128 queues. And that's really, yeah, a big difference. And that's also a thing when somebody wants to test performance or, 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 or writing a paper, doing performance, comparing, for example, I.O. schedulers. Uh, I found some very interesting papers from a university in the Netherlands, I think, uh, from this year, which where the students have analyzed uh, all this stuff. And then I've seen in, in the documentation that they are using uh, client SSDs, which may have eight or 16 uh, queues. And this is really a pity because um, the performance may be different when you have really the data center stuff here. So I encourage everyone or every company to support uh, uh, universities uh, here, for example, that we can get really feedback uh, on, on real data center hardware and not on, on home, home hardware here. And in this case for the test uh, system, which is running a Proxmox node here, as you can see from my colleague uh, Jonas, uh, we're having um, here uh, AMD CPU uh, with uh, 16 cores, one socket, hyper-threading enabled. And so for that reason, we're having 32 hardware queues, although the SSD would be capable of servicing 128 ones. So here it is visible that it really depends on the hardware and you can easily take a look at it. You can go to the terminal and look up this information. And yeah, then you're in this area here. Before you go down to the drivers, to the device drivers, just a, a rough view here. It really depends on the device and which way the request goes. And in the end, you end up down below here on the real hardware. <coughs> and for those of you who are working in the embedded space uh, with the MTD devices and raw flash, here, step in here to the MTD layer. And I'm still working on, uh, have it on my, on my list to do a, a special diagram for this thing here and on the side you see for the loop devices going up back then and here the way for the for the SCSI and SATA and SATA drives. So when I put it in the big picture, I think you should do a big picture for a uh, uh, monitor view. So on the left you see the upper half, on the right you see the, the, the lower half here. But yeah, best way is just to download it and before I end, I want to, to thank a few people uh, here, especially uh, Christoph Helwig, uh, Richard, and Hannes Reinecke, uh, because all the things that I've told, this is not my knowledge, this is their knowledge, and for that I want to give a big round of applause to them for helping me out, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay, so time is over. Thank you for coming. Um, in case there are a few questions left, um, we have people here who can answer questions. And <laughs> maybe not just raise, raise your hands um, if you have any questions. 
Yeah, it seems everybody needs to get the train back. So thank you for listening. Have a nice day and enjoy your time if you are the Plumbers Conference. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye.